Hey guys, Matt Brunig here. I wanted to do a video about unemployment. If you follow the news or follow some of the releases from the statistical agencies, you know, you've probably heard that unemployment is really low, you know, 3.5% or 3.4% or something like that. Oftentimes it, it gets reported as, you know, the lowest unemployment rate in 40 years or 50 years or something to that effect. Um, and while I don't want to necessarily diminish, you know, that as, as a good thing, as an accomplishment, I, I do think that those numbers um, can often mislead people about how common unemployment is. Um, and the reason is because those, un those numbers are point-in-time numbers for specific months. Um, and in a specific month, maybe you only have 3.5% of workers who are unemployed, but what about over a two-month period or a three-month period or a six-month period or a 12-month period or a 24-month period, right? If you expand out, I think there's another worthwhile question when we're thinking about unemployment, which is not just how many people are unemployed at a specific point in time, but how many people face a spell of unemployment over the course of just a few months or a year or two years. Um, and when we look at that, I think what we're going to see is a lot more people are unemployed than you think. And that might change the way that you approach unemployment. Because I think the way that these point in time measures work is they make you think that there are these kind of two groups of people in society, right? You have, uh, you have employed people who are 95% of uh, the workforce, let's say, and then you have unemployed people who are this other 5%. And the idea is that these are like the same people every month, right? Every month it's the same 95% who go to work and the same 5% who really want work. And all we're doing when we're focused on policies, we're trying to get more of that 5% into the 95%. We're trying to move people out of the unemployed bucket and into the employed bucket. But if we take a, a broader view and don't just look at a point in time and we follow people over the course of a year or two years or whatever, what you're going to find is that these buckets are very porous and that a lot more people are unemployed over even short periods of time than these point in time measures that we tend to talk about uh, would seem to suggest. So Let's hop into that. This will be a data tutorial kind of piece. Uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a calculation I've never done before. I'm very interested to see what it looks like. Um, but I'll try to make it entertaining, even if you're not interested in the data. Try to keep a nice little running dialogue um, and use some of the chapters uh, in the bottom here to skip some of the data stuff if you're uninterested in that. So let's hop in. For starters, the uh, unemployment statistics that you're probably used to seeing, they all come from this file here. Uh, the basic monthly CPS, CPS stands for Current Population Survey. And every month the uh, census uh, produces this survey. I think they interview 60,000 people or some, something like that. And so you can see here it is for December, here it is for November, here it is for October. And you can download these files from uh, this website, from the census website, and you can run your own calculations, and you can even produce the exact same unemployment rate that they put out in the reports. You could you can reproduce all the reports that they put out. Um, in fact, back in the day when I was, uh, I briefly dabbled in teaching people how to do this, kind of like on the side, I would have them, I would teach them how to recreate the uh, monthly unemployment report using this file. But that's neither here nor there. If you want to see how it works, we can go into the data dictionary here. Um, the data dictionary looks like this. It's going to contain all the variables in the file. Um, and just like the IPUMS data stuff, which we're going to get to uh, in a minute, which I've done some videos on, um, for the data dictionary here, they use a fixed width kind of idea. So here would be variable number one in the file. It's HRHHID. It's the household identifier. And that variable is located on character one through 15 of any given line in the file. So if you isolate character one and 15 of every line in the file, then you'll have a list of all of the household identifiers in the file. And it just goes like this, right? All the way through. So here's the month. And the month is contained in character 16 through 17. And then here's the year. The year is contained in character eight through 18 through 21. So each line will have a number of characters. Those characters will correspond with these locations and these variables. And then here are the numbers that you see in the variable, right? So if the, if the HR month, which is uh, character 16 and 17, if character 16 and 17 says 
zero one, then you know that's January because that's the first month. If they say 12, then you know that's December and then, you know, all the things in between. Anyways, that's how it works. They also put out, as you see here, th this is how it was put out for a very long time. I think I mentioned this in another video. You only had these fixed width files and this is what I learned on using. And so you'd have to isolate these variables by cutting out these parts of each line. Now they have this CSV um, and the CSV, you'll be able to just match the names to the to the full. so people these days the kids these days very lazy they just use the csvs um, but anyways when you use this file you have this variable here pimler um maybe i should bump it up a little bit oh boy um pimler which i think is personal monthly labor recode anyways um, as we see with Pimler here, there are four possible options. Pimler is located in character 180 through 181. So if you go to character 180 through 181 on the line, and then you'll isolate it and you'll see whether that contains a one, two, three, four, or it can also contain, I think, a negative one. And negative one means that um, it that that particular particular person is was not asked this question. Like it's an irrelevant person. It's a person who is outside of the universe. Um, the universe in this case is people who are age 16 and above who are uh, not in prison and not in the military, roughly speaking, right? So if you're, if you're below 16, uh, you're in prison or you're in the military, you'll get a negative one here, even though it, they don't show that here. Everyone else will get a one through seven, okay? And what they'll do is they'll add up the population that is one, two, three, and four, and that will be your denominator. So that's everyone who's either employed or unemployed. And then for the numerator, they will just add up the population for three and four, and that gets you unemployed, right? So if you take unemployed and you divide it by unemployed plus employed in the denominator, that gets you the unemployment rate. Um, and they have a special weight for this. Um, if you are going to try to do this, I'm not going to do this here, but they have a special weight for this that they use. It's called the uh, composited final weight. Um, anyways, you would use this as your weight. Not, uh, I think they have another one called like the basic final weight or whatever. This is the weight that they use. So you want to use this one. Anyways, it is with that file and those two variables that you get this information. Probably not all the way back here because I think the current population survey doesn't be begin to like 1976 or something like that. So I don't know where these all come from, but anything you know from 1976 on was basically produced from a file that looks like that, just like I told you. And here's the unemployment level. So this is the number of people who are unemployed. So this is just gonna be um, the number of people who were three or four. So you just add up the number of people who are three or four. You use the weight to get an estimate of their uh, how how much of the overall population they represent, and you'll get this right. So here, you know, let's take a month. April two thousand fifteen, eight point five million people were unemployed, right? Meaning that they were either three or four here, right? And then for the unemployment rate, right? We can just we just take employed. We take unemployed here and we divide it by employed plus unemployed here, and that gets us the unemployment rate. So let's take a random month. March 2016 is 5%. That's how it's done. <clears throat> and these are the numbers that you will see in all the newspapers every month. This is the thing, like if you follow this, this is the thing you, you tend to, to focus on. Um, but there's another variable that you can get out of this, another bit of data that you can get out of this that is rarely reported that you can actually retrieve it from this table um, and you can produce it yourself. Um, but uh, this is, the other uh, <clears throat> number you can use is called uh, labor flows or flows into unemployment. You see I've highlighted here, flows into unemployment. And flows into unemployment is a little bit different from unemployment, right? Because in a given month, the normal unemployment level or unemployment rate, they just figure out how many people are unemployed, right? In that month. Flows into unemployment, see, it tracks how many people were employed in one month and then in unemployed in the next month. So you show up in, you know, January, the, the census taker calls you and they say, are you employed? You say, yes, I am very much so. And then in February, they call you again and they say, are you employed? And you go, oh no, I lost my job. I'm unemployed now. So now you count as someone who has flowed into unemployment, right? How much you've, right? So, um, 
And I guess it deserves pointing out, right, that this survey, this monthly survey, what they do is they interview people for four months, right? So you come into the survey, let's say you come into the survey in January, they interview you in January, February, March, and April for four months. Then for the next eight months, they don't interview you at all. And then for the next four months, they interview you again, right? So you're in for four months, out for eight months, in for four months. And because you're in for these consecutive months, we can use uh, the fact that we're checking in on you for four straight months, we can use that to estimate how many people are flowing into unemployment. So for this, we're going to use employed to unemployed. I'm going to use total for not seasonally adjusted and total for seasonally adjusted. And then we can retrieve the data. Um, we can include the graph. And I'm actually going to put, uh, well, let's, let's see what this looks like. Um, so we see this big spike. This is the COVID spike. This is how many people flowed into unemployment at the like the worst month of, of COVID. It was, what, 17 million people in one month flowed into unemployment from employment. Um, but that kind of makes the rest of the graph hard to see. So let's do 2019. Um, and now we can kind of see, you know, this is the not seasonally adjusted series. And this is the seasonally adjusted series. Um, and what you can also do with this is you can kind of take a whole year here. So let's take 2018 and you can just add up all of this. I'm not going to do it here, but if you add up all these numbers, then you can kind of get how many times people went from employment to unemployment in a given year. And it's usually around 20 million, give or take. Um, so now we're already talking about quite a bit more than the number that you'll see in the unemployment rate, right? Because in the unemployment rate here, the unemployment level like even in the in some of the bad, like let's say 2018 here, you know, at a given month in time, we say there's only 6 million people who are unemployed. But over the course of the whole year of 2018, again, I'm not going to do the math, but that's probably around 20 million, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Right. So now that's a lot more. That's a lot, almost what, two and a half times uh, what, what, you would, what you would conclude about how many people are unemployed just using this um, uh, information here where we track flows instead of tracking a single, uh, uh, instead of tracking levels. Right. But there's another <clears throat> way you can do this. And I've never done this before. So I'm interested to see. Um, how it works. Um, so this is IPUM CPS. It's just, they use the same exact file as uh, this file here, the the CPS, right? And they they just kind of make it easier to use, especially if you're if you want to analyze, you know, hundreds and hundreds of months at a time. It's very difficult. You'd have to download all these files. They make that very easy to use. Um, and uh, what they do with this, um, so like I said, it's a monthly survey, but in the March, in March of each month, they have a special set of questions that they ask people on top of their usual questions. And they basically ask them questions about uh, things that happened to them last year. So like in March of 2018, they'll say, all right, I got some questions for you about 2017. Buckle up. Question number one, how much money did you make from your job in 2017? How much money did you get from food stamps in 2017? How many weeks were you employed? How many hours do you typically work? And they ask all these questions about the prior year, right? And so what they've done here at IPUMS uh, is, um, one, you can just get that information for a single year, but they've also made it possible for you to get that information for two years. And the way that you can get it for two years is because, remember, like I said before, people come into the survey for four months, they're out for eight months, and then they come in again for four months. So that means on any given March, which is when they ask the questions about all of last year, in any given March, about a third of the people who are in that March survey and got asked those annual questions were also in the prior March survey and therefore got asked the annual questions about the prior year. Um, I think in another video I said it was one fourth. It, do the math, four divided by 12 is a, is a third. So it's actually a third. Um, but they make this very easy to use. And so what I'm gonna use this to do is I wanna answer a very simple question. In a given two year period, what percent of people who worked at some point during that two-year period, right? So they were employed at some point during that two-year period. What percent of those people were also unemployed at some point during those two-year period? Because as I, remember, as I mentioned before, these are not discrete groups. The employed and the unemployed are the same people 
just at different points in time. And I think this might be a way to really drive it home. Now, I'd love to do not just two years, but three years, four years, five years, six years. With this survey, you're only going to be able to do two years. There are other surveys where you can do longer stretches of time. I think uh, the National um, Longitudinal Survey of Youth, the NLSY, is one that people use uh, for this purpose sometimes. Uh, but those surveys are kind of difficult to use. Um, I should probably crack one open and give another shot at some point. Uh, this survey is very easy to use even the longitudinal one when you're doing two years at a time because IPUMS has linked the people that you need to link across those two years, and they've created these samples that only include the relevant people um, across the two years, okay? Anyway, so we're going to create our, our extract here. The first thing we're going to do is select our samples. Look, I'm selecting longitudinal samples. You can also select these cross-sectional samples where you can get you know, just a one-year file for the ASEC, which is the March file where they ask the annual questions, or you can get, look, 564 months of data going all the way back here. Um, I want the longitudinal files. Um, I'm going to select all the default samples. Oh, wait, select all the samples here, okay? And so all these are two-year files uh, that are constructed the way I just uh, discussed, okay? So let's do the longitudinal file. Now, the first thing we're going to want to do is add the longitudinal weight. Normally, the IPUMS will add the relevant weight you need, but for longitudinal files, they uh, have not quite figured that out, so we are going to use the uh, you know search for it and find it here. We're going to use this longitudinal weight for two adjacent years. Again, we're going to weight all of our data, so we use the weight because that weight represents the number of people like a given person who's surveyed, they will say that person is equal to like 1,500 people or 2,000 people. That's how many people they represent in the overall population. So we always want to use the weights to make sure that we're able to capture, um, you know, how much, how many people they represent in the population because they use the weighting to try to make it representative of the population as a whole, right? All right, now, uh, so we'll add this, but here's the thing. As I'm looking at this now, they have these slashes. So the X means that you have the variable in the year. The dot means that you don't have the variable. So none of these none of these weights right here are in the file, which makes sense because it's a two-year file. So the dots, that, that variable is not available. The X means the variable is available. And as I learned last time I was doing this, the slash means the variable is available for one of the two years, right? Because these are two-year files. So this is year 21 and 2022. The slash means we only get the weight uh, for one of the years. Um, and we see that there's a couple of files in which that's the case uh, year. So I'm going to go back into the sample and I'm going to kill all the years that have that to it, right? So we had the last year. I don't want those. I want the years where we have both uh, years present with the weight. Um, look, this one they already said, look, we can't even link the data, so we're not even going to make it possible for you to download this file. This was one of the ones where you get a half year. I don't want a half year. I want the full, or you get half of the years. I want both years, not one of them. So we'll just uncheck those, submit the samples again. Simple as that. Now look, we get all X's across the board. Beautiful, that's what we want. All right, next thing we're going to do is we want to know work, right? And you're going to go to this one, ASEC. ASEC, remember, that's the name of the March file. That's the name of the file where you get the annual variables. They do it once a year. You want to do the ASEC for what we're doing here. Let's go into work. If we do work, we have uh, two variables that we want here. We have works, work, weeks worked last year. I'll click on that so we can look at it. And then we have weeks unemployed last year. And if you click on it, I'm opening it in a new tab. You can see, you know, it'll describe it. This reports the number of weeks that corresponded worked in the year. You can also see the questionnaire text sometimes, which is cool. Oh yeah, here we go. How many weeks did you work even for a few hours? Include pay vacation and sick leave. And sick leave. <clears throat> Enter 97 if respondent can only answer in months. Um, okay, troubling. <laughs> okay, so we have that for weeks work. For weeks unemployed, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same thing. Now, we need to be careful here with these codes because this ran us into problems in one or the other. So you would think, oh, well, it'll just say how many weeks unemployed. So either there'll be zero or there'll be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 52. But here they're telling us, look, if the code says 99, then that person is not in the universe. So when we're doing our, our math later on, we need to make sure that anyone who has a code of 99, that we ignore them. 
because we don't want to start picking up people, you know, with 99s and say that they were unemployed because they weren't unemployed. They're, they're just, you know, they were not in the universe. Um, so we want to make sure we do that. Is there anything with week's work here? No, it just says a two-digit numeric variable. Um, we don't seem to get anything that says, hey, be careful. We, we coded one of these as 99 for some reason. Um, we don't seem to get anything like that. So, okay, great. So we want these two variables. Um, and we'll just add them right here. Weeks worked and weeks unemployed. So what I'm going to do um, is here, let's check out. And when we check out, I don't need anything but year and the stuff I selected, the weight, and then these two variables. That's the only thing I need. So I'm going to create this data extract, and we will submit it, and off we go. Now, they have a beautiful new uh, little table here um, that they use, which is cool. Um, but for our purposes here... Um, Oh, I, I guess I should say I already downloaded this earlier a couple times, actually. Um, and so that way we don't have to wait for this to process. So here's the code book. The code book file documents the contents of the extract and provides column locations for fixed width files, right? So I'll open the code book. Just click basic here. It's just a, a, a simple text file. And what we're going to do is here are the variables. And then here are the characters in each line that the variables correspond to. So we can use the characters in each line to kind of cut out that information and then we can uh, do the math on it. Now, as I mentioned in the prior uh, video, the longitudinal files, each variable has like two versions. You have, each variable has an underscore one and an underscore two version. Underscore one, underscore two, underscore one, underscore two. And underscore one is gonna be the first year of the file. So if it's a file that covers 2017 and 2018, year number one should say 2017, and year number two should say 2018. And then work weeks underscore one is gonna be the work weeks for year number one, and then work weeks underscore two will be the work weeks for year number two, and so forth and so on, right? So it's all on one line, which is what makes it so easy. In other files, when you're doing this longitudinal data, you gotta track people over time, and this is a lot more complicated, like in terms of coding. Um, so anyways, we got that set up, and um, let's see what this looks like. So uh, when you download the file, the file, here's, this is my little directory. I have this little folder called longitudinal, um, and in that folder, I have some of the old data files that I've downloaded before, and then here are my Python um, scripts. Um, and, you know, I use the Python scripts to run code against this data and produce all sorts of lovely information. In this case, the data I have is contained in CPS, this 042 CPS file. So let's open that up. All right. So each line in the file is a person in the survey, right? So this is one person and this is their information, and this is one person, and this is their information, and this is one person, and this is their information, right? Um, and as you can see, when we go to the data dictionary, these columns um, show you what characters on the line correspond to what variables. So columns one through four correspond to year number one. So let's do columns one, four, one through four. So this is the first line. Columns one through four is this, are these right here, these four, 1978. So year number one for that record is 1978. And then we can do year number two, which is columns five through eight. So let's do columns or characters five through eight. Whoops, oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Right? So year number two is 1979. That's what you expect because it's a two-year file. So year one is one year and year two is it, right? And then, then, you know, the rest of this stuff corresponds. These characters are over here and, you know, you'll capture all that. Okay. So that's what that looks like. Um, oh, Lord. What's going on? All right. Let's see how many lines are in the file, by the way. That's always fun. Um, the CPS files don't have as many uh, lines as, uh, you know, the other ones. But uh, we have here, is that right? Um, 1,000, well, let's see what we got. 1.9 million lines. All right. Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, oh, I guess I should explain this up here. So what we do, this is the, f the name of the file. It just opens the file, and then uh, it creates this list called data. And data is uh, every item in the list is just a line in the file. So let's open the file again. Um, so this is item number one. So it would be, or I should say this is item number zero, because we start from zero. So data zero, that line is just this. It just contains this long number. And then data one contains this number. And then data two contains this number. And then data three, right? So we just we just create this list that has 1.9 million uh, items in it. And each item in the list is just one row in the line, which is just that long number, right? And then the next thing we do is we're going to loop through the line. So what happens is, and we'll open the file again, the first time, this is called a for loop. So the first time we go through this loop, um, the variable line, that variable, is going to be assigned this number, which is just a line in the file. And then the second time we go through the loop, the variable line is going to be assigned this number. And then the third time we go through the loop, the variable line is going to be assigned this number, all the way until it's gone through 1.9 million loops and the, and the variable line has, at some point or another, been assigned every single one of these variables. So what we're going to do is, for whenever line is assigned, uh, you know, the, when we go through each line one by one, we want to capture the information we're trying to get from that line. And then at the end, we can add it all up and, and do stuff like that. Um, so this is going to be fairly easy. So remember from above, we have year one. Um, I'm going to do year two. I'm going to peg everything to year two because that's the second year and it's easy to talk about prior years than subsequent years. So year two is five through eight. That's the columns we're trying to get. We're going to put four, eight. Um, and again, it's four instead of five because four is the space right before five. And so it allows us to capture five. You can just remember to take, you know, this number and for the first one, just move it back one. Um, okay. And then we're going to get the weight. Now, as I've mentioned in some in one of my other uh, videos, for these longitudinal files, it shows up as, there's, as there being two weights, but there's actually only one weight, which makes sense. We don't we don't want different weights for different years, ideally. So there's only this only this weight has a number in it. This weight is just set equal to zero. So we're not going to mess with that at all. Um, so weight number one is what nine through twenty-two. So we're going to say eight eight through twenty-two. All right, so that gets us the year and the weight. So far, so good. Um, now, what other variables do we need? Um, we're going to eventually need all four of these. So let's just go ahead and put those in right at the top. Um, so we have weeks work equal oh, one, right? Because underscore one equals int line. And then what is the first line for that? It is 37 through 38. So we're going to put 36 through 38, right? All right. And then we can do weeks work two. And weeks work two is going to be 39 through 40. So we're going to say 38 through 40, right? And then we have the same thing for uh, weeks unemployed. Uh, weeks, let's just do it as a weeks on one equals uh, 41 through 42. So we're going to say 40 through 42. And if you notice a pattern here, it's just every two one. So I'm going to take advantage of that pattern here <laughs> and 42 and 44. All right. Now remember from earlier, if we can go back, um, there was something goofy about weeks unemployed that we want to make sure we don't screw up. So the goofy thing was that if the var if the value says 99, then it's not in the universe. So what we want to do before we do anything else is make sure we don't screw around with this 99. Um, and how do we want? Do we want to just say anyone who's 99? Well, let's let's start this way. Let's actually print some of these weeks to see. Does 99 also include people who had no unemployed months? 
So like 99 also means zero, or do we have some zeros in here? Let's see. Um, also, actually, before we do that, let's open up this file um, again in our text editor. Now look, notice the first record here. These last two numbers, right? There's, there's two two-digit numbers. There's 99, and then there's another 99. These are these variables, right? So the first one is weeks unemployed for year one, and the second one is weeks unemployed for year two. Now notice the first record here, we have 99s, right? So that's cool. So those people are not in the universe. We want to get rid of them. Um, for the second one, his first one, he has zero weeks unemployed, and then in the second year, he has 26 weeks unemployed. Okay. So that's interesting. Um, and then, so we know that zero can is a number that's in the file, right? So you can have zero weeks unemployed. That doesn't get you a 99 number, which I was worried about. So that's good. But then notice here, look, zero, this one has two weeks unemployed in year number one, which is 1978. And then in year number two, they show up as not in the universe, which is 1979. So, and this is my first time uh, opening up this file. So we have this problem here where the person is, uh, they're not in the universe only for one of the years. <laughs> Now, I want to capture the fact that this person was unemployed at some point, right? It looks like in year number one, um, they were, in year number one, they worked 49 weeks and they were unemployed for two. In year number two, it shows they worked 52 weeks and then it says they were not in universe for 99. Um, so it looks like actually 99 does indicate zero for this guy because he worked 52 weeks and he had zero weeks unemployed. For this one over here, he worked 40 weeks and then had zero weeks unemployed. So I guess the reason they didn't put a 99 here is not because 99 doesn't sometimes indicate zero. It's because um, in this case, he didn't work 52 weeks, right? So if, you, if this said 52, they probably would have put a 99 here. Um, so let's think for a second what we want to do about all this. Um, now, what I think I want to do is let's start with uh, let's start by isolating everyone who have at least one week of work, and we'll do it for one year at first because that'll make it easy, right? So, if weeks work, and we're going to start with the second year, um, is greater than zero, then and now here's where we need to add up the population. Okay, so. Let's think about that for a second. So I'm going to need a counter that I can use to add up the population uh, for whom, who worked at least something. But I'm going to need a counter that takes into account all the years in the file, right? Because we have all these years here. Um, so the first year is 1978, I believe. No, right? Yes, 1970. Well, it's going to be, the first year is going to be 1979 because we're never going to get a 19. 78 that we will get it sometimes let's just put that in there just in case okay the first year is going to be 1978 and then the last year is going to be 2020 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say um let's delete this for the moment i want to create these little counters i'm going to use python dictionaries to do it so 4i in range 1978 to 2021 the last uh, one, okay, so then we'll print I, and we'll see what this looks like, okay? All right. Again, I do this just to kind of be clear on what we're doing. Um, okay, so Python 3.7 unemployment. Okay. So it's going to start with 78, and then, okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little dictionary, um, and this is going to be employed people. And the, these little brackets create a little dictionary. And so um, I'm going to initialize every, every year in the dictionary with zero. And then I'll just add up. I'll add to that zero when I get into the loop. Again, is this a little bit goofy? It's a little bit goofy, but it works. Um, and, and we don't have to open up pandas or do anything like that. So we'll say employed i equals zero. 
So what we're going to do is we'll go through this loop. The first time we go through the loop, I is given the value 1978. So it's employed 1978 equals zero. And then employed 1979 equals zero. So I'm setting this counter variable equal to zero for all the years. Okay, And then as we loop through here, we will be able um, to fill up these counters based on what we see here. Okay, So let's try this. If weeks worked, and I'm going to do year number two. If weeks worked in year number two is greater than zero, then employed year two plus plus equal. <laughs> There's a little shortcut for you. Uh, one. So the first time it goes through, the first person that it shows that's, that this person worked, oops, I need to put weeks worked, right? Uh, that would have been a disaster. The first person it goes through where it says that they worked, initially the, for that year, the number is going to say zero in, the, in this counter, and then we're just going to add their weight to the zero. Does that make sense? So as we go through, we'll be able to, at the end of this loop, we'll have all the weight for all the people who were employed for at least a week in a given year, okay? Now, there are going to be some years that get skipped because we don't have all the years in the file. Remember that. So let's try that. Um, we're going to just kind of start this again down here. Um, Okay, I think that should work. Hmm. All right, so it says some of the files have a 2021 year in it. Yeah, I guess, because, okay. All right. So we'll fix that. Let's see what we get. All right, perfect. Um, and here, actually, I should probably put the I in here as well. Um, these weights are kind of meaningless because, again, th this is not a. Uh, this is only a third of the population, um, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, aggregate up to the uh, total amount uh, that you you would want. Um, but We'll go ahead and copy that over in the spreadsheet. And again, that's how many people in those years were employed for at least one week. So let's start with the year 1978, 1979, and we're trying to go to year 2020, right? Um, oh, wait, no, no. Because this has... All right year 2021 is in the file as well. So, okay, great. So let's do that. This is a little shortcut. I don't know why I'm doing it like this. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Employed. Now, we don't really care about these raw numbers because these numbers are just the weights. Um, but technically, you should divide by 1,000 or 10,000 because the weight has four implied decimal places, which I've talked about in another video. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here just, just to be as clean as possible. Um, and I'm going to print it without the year in front of it because that will allow me to easily just copy and paste. Um, as we see here. And then off we go. Okay. Great, so employed in year. Okay, so now for that same year, we wanna get how many people who were employed during that year were also unemployed during that year. And now here's where we're running into this challenge. Let's open the file again. And I sincerely have not worked through this problem yet. <laughs> But it looks like sometimes they use 99 to mean that the person uh, worked, were, was unemployed for zero months during the year, right? So here's another one. He worked for 52, month, 52 weeks in both years, and he was unemployed for zero weeks, which they code as 99 instead of zero. Um, now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to recode 99 as zero, 
And the reason I'm going to do that is because anyone who worked at some point during the year, um, we're going to, they're already going to be in the universe of people who worked, right? Because we're already, we're only counting them if they worked at some point during the year anyways. So we're not having to worry about the fact that some of the people who are, are probably coded as not in universe are people who are just too young. So like, here's one right here where they didn't work. They work zero hours in both years. And then they were unemployed for 99 to 99. That's probably a child, right? That's probably like a five-year-old. And so the five-year-old was, didn't work at all, but also wasn't unemployed, was unemployed for zero weeks, which they code as 99 because they want to say, look, if it's a child, we don't count them as unemployed. Uh, I don't know. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to count 99 as, as someone who had zero weeks of unemployment, which is good because that means we're only going to uh, count people who um, were, were unemployed at some point during the year. So that, that doesn't hurt us at all. So let's try this. If weeks one equals 99, then I'm going to recode that as a zero, right? And then we'll do that for the other one too. If weeks equal 99, then we're going to recode that as zero. Okay. So now it really is zero. If it says zero, that means the person uh, had zero weeks of unemployment. So we can just say if weeks two, if the weeks of unemployment is greater than zero, then unemployed year two is going to be plus equal weight one. Now I need to go up here and initiate unemployed. Okay. So now what we'll get at the end of this is we'll get not only the number of people who were employed during year number two, but also the number of people who had some amount of unemployment in year two. Okay. And so for that, I can just change this, print it, and then uh, up. When you're comparing, so if you're saying, this says if weeks unemployed is equal to 99, when you're comparing, you need to use two equal signs. When you're assigning, you use one equal sign. So I compare what's in weeks sun two, which is assigned here to 99. I say, if those are the same thing, then down here actually, actually assign zero to that variable. So that when we get down here, we can just say anything that's above zero, we're gonna count them as having been unemployed at some point during the year, right? I hope this is clear. Um, you know, this is all very, very basic coding stuff. Um, but I know it can be difficult if you haven't done anything like it at all before. Um, okay, great. So we'll just copy and paste this over. This is how many people who were employed at some point during the year, they were employed at some point during the year, were also unemployed at some point during the year. Okay. Unemployed in year, right? So what's important to note here, we are not counting people who were unemployed for the entire year. If you are unemployed for 52 weeks, which some people do, are sometimes unemployed for 52 weeks. If you were unemployed for 52 straight weeks, you're not going to be counted in this. We're only counting you if you were also employed at some point, right? So this in a way is understating a little bit unemployment, or you might say, we're trying to make sure that you really were a worker because maybe someone says they were unemployed all year, but maybe they're not trying all that hard. Who knows, right? So we're only counting people who were employed at least at some point during the year. All right. And so when we do that, we get this number. Um, and so right away, we now have an opportunity to create a nice little, oh Lord, uh, to create a nice little weight. Okay. So unemployment spell percent. So what percent of the people who were employed in a year had an unemployment spell during that same year? Uh, these zeros are, are not uh, are going to give us, uh, you know, division by zero, which we don't want. But, uh, you know, I'll clear those out later as we start preparing, you know, the graph. Okay. Um, all right. 
So in a given year, right, we're talking about 8.6%. You know, let's talk about a more recent year. Pre-COVID, we had 5.9% of people who were unemployed at some point during the year. Um, 2011, 10% of people were unemployed at some point during the year. In 2021, it was 12.5% uh, were unemployed at some point during the year. Um, okay. Great. So now I want to do it for two years, okay? So for two years, we're, I'm just going to copy this again over here, in, and then it'll just be for, we'll know that this is for the two-year numbers, okay? So for the two-year numbers, we're going to do the same thing, except I'm going to ask if you were, if you were, if you worked at any point during either year, right? So if you have more than one week between either year, and then this one, if we had more than one week of unemployment in either year, right? All right, so if we do that, then what do we get, okay? So first, let's copy over the employment amounts. These are the number, this is sort of the total weighted amount of people who were employed at least one week during the two years. And then we can run it again here with unemployed. And we can copy that over. All right. And then we'll do the Dividing, <laughs> and what do we get? All right, now we got some good numbers in here. Um, I mean, look, <laughs> 1984, uh, 20, in, the, in, the, in 1984 and 1983, if you take those two years combined, at some point, you know, almost one in four workers were unemployed. They faced a spell of unemployment. Um, Let's take the sort of financial crisis here. At the peak of the financial crisis here in 2011, if you take these two years, in 2011 and 2010, workers in those two years, at some point in those two years, 17% of all workers face some unemployment in just those two years, right? More recently, we've had some lower years. We, uh, we dipped below 10% uh, uh, there briefly. I think that was the first time we dipped below 10%. Um, yeah, in the whole series in 2020, but then it shut back up in 2021. Of course, that's including uh, COVID years and, and things of that nature. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a lot more prevalent than you think. You know, if you look at the unemployment rate in 2019, you would say, oh, it's only three and a half percent. Only three and a half percent of people are unemployed. What a great, it's actually triple that. It's actually triple that. And if you take this this uh, person right here, this person, you know, on a, some people are solo workers. They live alone. Uh, here, my face is probably in the way. Sorry. Um, if you take this person right here, that's 10% of all workers. But that person, you know, they may live with a spouse. They may live with kids. Like as a percentage of the population who's being either directly or indirectly affected by unemployment, um, it's, it's going to be quite, quite substantial. Um, and this is just in a two-year period. Now ask yourself a question, over the course of five years or over the course of 10 years, what percent of workers do you think face a spell of unemployment? It's going to be at least 50%, right? 60%, something like that, who are unemployed for at least one week during a year. Um, so all this is just to say that unemployment is a lot more common than people seem to think. Um, and there's not a whole lot, I don't know, that you can really do about it, I guess. Um, you know, like, you're not going to get to 0% unemployment because the nature of the beast is that we are constantly reallocating workers in our society. Workers, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to keep one worker in the same firm forever and ever. They, that firm might not need that labor anymore. And so it would make, it makes sense logically and, and, and in terms of like creating a well-designed economy that when a firm doesn't need a worker, that they release that worker and then that worker goes and works somewhere else. We want workers to 
be, re, you know, reallocated from one job to another, from one firm to another as needed. Otherwise, we're wasting a lot of labor that we could be u- using uh, productively, right? So this kind of reallocation is important. Um, and so what we really should be thinking about more than trying to say, well, how can we get that headline unemployment rate as low as possible? That's really the key as if that, you know, finally solves your unemployment problem. What we really need to be thinking about is how do we want to support workers when we are reallocating them, right? As workers hop from one firm to another who go, because this is not even all the reallocation, right? Some people, uh, you know, they, they might have been unemployed for less than a week, or they might have gone from one job to another. But as people are reallocating from one employer to another, um, what kind of support do we want to provide uh, to them? And I would say we should provide very generous support. And, and one reason you should think that is because it's actually a lot more common than you realize. It's not a tiny fraction of the population, you know, who happen to have low levels of education or something like that. I mean, it's pretty much everyone, right? In a, in a, even in like a decent year, I don't know, 2017, a decent year, you know, in the in the two year, in the 24 months prior, uh, in that 24 month period between Jan 2016 and, and December 2017, you know, 12% of people were unemployed at some point, you know? And like I said before, if you go to four, five, six, seven years, it could be five, six, 60%, 50, 60% of people who were unemployed at some point. Um, the other thing to think about here is as people are being unemployed all the time, they're losing their employer sponsored insurance. And that's also built into our system, right? So within this two year period, roughly speaking, 10% of people lost their employer, ins- employer sponsored insurance purely from the fact that they went from employment to unemployment at some point. And it wasn't just those 10% of workers, it's also their children and their spouse and whatever, right? So once again, does it make sense to design our economy in such a way that you lose your insurance when you lose your job, given that we know a lot of people are losing their job? In fact, everyone prob- almost everyone loses a job at some point in their life. I would say no. So what I take away from this is just kind of like we really need to have a nice welfare state that catches people when they're unemployed, that enables the reallocation of labor, that doesn't uh, connect health insurance to unemployment. And we also need to be a little bit more realistic when we're thinking about the economy, right? Because when we think about the economy and we look at these unemployment rates that are just these point in time monthly unemployment rates, we really miss a lot of the anguish that's occurring kind of under the surface. We miss all these people who are flowing from employment to unemployment every month, which over the course of a year that happens, you know, 20 million some odd times. We miss all these people who, yeah, they might be employed this month, but they weren't the month before and they're not going to be the month uh, later. We miss all those people. And there's a lot more pain that's occurring kind of under the aggregate level uh, that, that we just don't pick up in those statistics. And once we appreciate that level of pain, one, I think you can understand why like a hot economy is not as big a deal politically as some people think it ought to be. Um, and, and then you can also understand why, uh, you know, we really do need a welfare state, even if you have uh, high levels of unemployment, even if, well, we've got full employment, so we don't need a welfare state. That's not true. Even if you got really low unemployment, you still got a lot of people moving in and out of unemployment. So you still need a welfare state. And if you don't have it, people are going to suffer. People are going to be unhappy. So I hope this tutorial was useful. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to mix these in with some of my other stuff. Um, and hey, I, may, I may even do a post on this. So uh, keep it coming. Subscribe. Hit the bell. Share with your friends. I just got over 3,000 subscribers yesterday. Very happy about that. So uh, I got more videos coming. So stay tuned.